Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Vladimir Putin knows how to probe for weakness in the West. With his troop buildup on the Ukrainian border, he is testing the unity of NATO. In particular, he's putting pressure on Europe's eastern flank. How will nations once in the Soviet orbit respond? Well, my guest is Kirill Petkov, Prime Minister of Bulgaria, which Moscow says must not host a NATO military presence. Now, this is a big test for a new Prime Minister in the EU's poorest country. Is Bulgaria ready to stand up to Russia? Prime Minister Kirill Petkov in Sofia, welcome to Hard Talk. Hi, Stephen. It's good to be with you. It's great to have you on the show, Prime Minister. I just referred to Vladimir Putin probing for weaknesses in NATO. Do you think Bulgaria is a weak link in NATO? Not at all. And not at all. We have uh, made a very clear position uh, that we are a strong voice in NATO and in the European Union and what you see from Bulgaria is a very predictable a member of, of NATO and I don't think uh, the, weak, the word weakness should be associated with us at all. You say very predictable. Some would say it's not quite clear where Bulgaria stands right now because uh, the NATO member states are very keen to push more forces into the eastern and southeastern flank of NATO, including to your country. We've got Spain, the Netherlands, the UK offering warplanes to Bulgaria. Do you want them? First, uh, Stephen, I want to make sure that all the viewers know that being part of NATO, the Bulgarian troops are also NATO troops. And what we believe is that uh, no matter where the NATO troops are from, originally, we act as one. That's the strength of, of NATO. So what we have decided as a government is to put Bulgaria as a framework nation with a battalion, uh, and this battalion would be under Bulgarian command, coordinated fully and coordinated fully with the NATO command. And at the same time, we fully realize that we don't have all the capabilities uh, required for a truly uh, effective battalion. So all the deficits that we have in terms of both equipment and troops, we're inviting our uh, partners from NATO to join so we can have a, a really effective battle group on the ground. But this is the first time that Bulgaria has decided not to be just a consumer of security, but to be a constructive member and actually putting its own troops uh, as part of the whole NATO force. Right, so but, I think but, this is as clear. Uh, right. Sorry, Prime Minister, sorry to interrupt, but, but the question is who's calling the shots here? Is it NATO command telling you, Bulgaria, what will, you will do in response to what is perceived to be a growing threat precipitated by the Ukraine crisis? Or are you in Sofia calling the shots? Because your defense minister, he seems to be on a slightly different page from you. Mr. Yanev says no one, and he's clearly talking about NATO high command, no one will impose decisions on us related to our security. So are you going to take those warplanes from Spain, the Netherlands and the UK or not? Yes, we are inviting our NATO partners to be part of the total strategy that's located in Bulgaria. But for the first time, we're trying to do something different. We're trying to put the Bulgarian battalion first for two reasons. First of all, we want to be active participants, not just to host uh, our friends to come uh, into Bulgaria, but to be working with them. The second thing is, throughout the, the last uh, years, unfortunately, our investment in defense has been very sporadic. There has not been a systematic approach to investment in security. So what we're trying to do is to use the crisis as an opportunity. Uh, form a Bulgarian battalion, be under Bulgarian command, identify where the deficits and right. weaknesses, invite NATO partners, and then, interestingly, invest in the military capacity going forward 
to fulfill this deficit. So, so, so uh, I want to so, be so, very, so, very clear. Right. So, yeah. so what is your message to Vladimir Putin then? He's made, the Russians have made it plain that they regard NATO military presence on your soil as an unacceptable provocation, and they want a NATO pullback from Bulgaria. It sounds like you're prepared to provoke Putin. I want to say very clearly another very important point. We do not believe in Bulgaria in, of areas of influence. We, we do not believe this is a past century, early past century history where somebody was drawing lines on a napkin. There is no such a thing. Every country has the ability to decide for itself. No foreign country can tell, uh, for example, Russia cannot tell how many troops we should have ourselves. And the whole idea of, that, of areas of influence is something that we do not believe. Small countries should have equal strong voice of what they should do inside their borders. And another thing, I, I also, and I'm truly uh, supported by our NATO members, uh, other me member states, is it doesn't matter if you're small or you're big, you're part of NATO. We cannot have class A and class B NATO countries. We cannot have more to the east and more to the west. We are all all NATO countries, and we should talk in one voice and act coordinatedly. That's the whole idea of NATO, which I truly believe in. Are you worried that uh, while you're head of government and you give me that particular message, your head of state, uh, that is President Radev, he, he's saying something rather different. Recently, he referred to Crimea as being Russian, currently Russian, he said. And he also argued that Western sanctions against Moscow simply don't work. So uh, Vladimir Putin may enjoy hearing his words rather more than yours. Uh, one thing that we have absolutely uh, the same with the president, and I think he also believes in this, and I believe in this, is that, of course, de-escalation is our first priority. It should be a priority for all of Europe. It should be a priority for all of uh, NATO countries. Diplomacy should be the first way to go, no matter what. Sanctions and any military build-up is only uh, in case of no other choice. So uh, in, this, in this respect, we speak in the same voice. Uh, well, he, he, says that, he says sanctions don't work. You say sanctions do work, do you? Because Joe Biden, as you will be well aware, wants you and all of the Western allies in NATO and the European Union to impose the most severe of sanctions if Vladimir Putin launches a new military operation in Ukraine. Are you telling me here and now that Bulgaria will be part of those crippling sanctions on Russia? I want to tell you something very important for NATO and for the European Union. We have to discuss as much as we have to, but in the end, when we speak to Russia, we have to speak in one voice. One of our strengths is to be, is to be connected, to be coordinated, to speak in one voice. Mm. If we start speaking in different voices within NATO, then we become automatically weak. Well, so well Mr. Prime Minister, you maybe you, may you need to yeah. tell your own president that, because your voice and his are rather different. No, no, I think the de-escalation uh, is one voice. Being part of NATO is one voice. There is Bulgarian troops and NATO troops is in one voice. The one thing that I want to make sure that I, I confirm here on this, uh, in this discussion is that uh, Bulgaria's position towards Crimea is identical and one of the same as the total position of the European Union, mm. and that Crimea is not part of Russia. Just, just one more question on sanctions. Uh, if uh, it comes to pass that there is a Russian military move in Ukraine and severe sanctions are put on Putin, there is no doubt that Putin will respond by taking measures, economic measures, against the EU and NATO member states. Bulgaria is extremely vulnerable. Your energy sector is dominated by Gazprom, by Lukoil, by Russian companies, and you will suffer. Do you think your people, 25% of whom say that they regard Russia as an ally which shares interests and values with Bulgaria, do you think your own people will be happy with that? So sanctions and energy risk is a big issue. This is why we're not, we want to explore all the, the steps of diplomacy and all the steps of de-escalation before na sanctions are imposed, because uh, you're absolutely right. Our gas dependency on Russia is absolutely uh, like it's more than double the, the one of the average of Europe. Mm. We also have dependency on, on the electricity, on our nuclear station. So yes, 
that would be a big problem for us if there is such a opposite sanctions. But here I had the chance to speak with our Brussels uh, friends in the European Commission and we have a plan that in the case of uh, special sanctions, they could be, we are, Bulgaria is still a net exporter of electricity. Maybe for some short period of time, there could be derogations. We are also building very fast right now the connection to Greece, where uh, we can actually have uh, potential access to other sources of, of gas. I've put uh, this connection from Bulgaria to Greece to be a top priority. We expect to happen in the next uh, four to five months. So we are actively trying to mitigate these risks, but it's important to say that these risks should be also borne by the unions together. We cannot separate the cost by individual country. We have to make sure that everybody has the same cost and weight if this happens as European Union and as, of, as NATO. In other words, we have to make sure that being together in one voice when we speak to Russia, but also facing the cost as uh, equally sharing it uh, in case th that happens. I right, really but, hope but it doesn't. In a word then, you are saying that you can survive if Russia turns off the energy taps to Bulgaria. Only if, if this happens, in this very severe case, if this happens, we can survive, but we have to limit our exports of electricity. So that means right. the, the common European market should make an exception in that case just now, for that period of time. All right. Now, let, let's move on to other issues. It strikes me this Ukraine crisis has arisen at a time where you are wrestling with the deepest, most difficult challenges inside your own country. I mean, politically, you've sort of come from nowhere to become prime minister at the end of last year. You promised your people when you got the job that you were going to make stopping corruption your number one priority. The problem is your mandate is weak. You only got 25 percent of the vote w with your party. The turnout was profoundly low. Only 38 percent of Bulgarians bothered to vote. And now your task is to completely change and reform Bulgaria's system of government governance to root out corruption. Can you do it? Yes, uh, I truly believe we can. Otherwise, it will not be in this position. Uh, our whole party came from mostly from the private sector, from businesses. We are all just sick and tired of connecting Bulgaria and corruption as common brands. So our true uh, dream is to, to speak to you in four years. And when we say corruption, Bulgaria to be a positive brand where everybody would say due to strong leadership in the anti-corruption campaign, uh, Bulgaria has been able to eradicate the fastest uh, the, the levels of corruption that they, it used to have. So you, I really hope to have a Harvard case in about four years where we can say <laughs> leadership can kill corruption in a very fast way. Now, in order not to sound what? like a dreamer, I want to tell you that we're taking active steps on it. So the very first week that we formed the government, we already have an anti-corruption commission in the parliament. We're, one of our first laws that we're working on is the anti-corruption commission investigative powers. We've put very strong language in the uh, resilience and recovery plan where we want to have special judge being able to prosecute the chief prosecutor where we think a lot of the problem is hidden right now. We have uh, stated very clearly zero tolerance to corruption. And let me tell you something. I gathered all my MPs uh, before we started. And I said, if any of you makes the wrong choice uh -huh. in the next four years, uh, we'll, I'll really uh, be happy to show an example that will start from our own group, not just the opposition. Right. So we, we have, the, the reason we got into power and the reason why we'll stay in power is because we will have zero tolerance to corruption. And well, if this causes the, st the stability of our coalition, we're willing to pay the price. Well, that, that, that's one heck of a pledge you're making, given that you are the EU's most corrupt country. And Transparency International actually suggests in recent years you've been going in the wrong direction, becoming more corrupt, not less. But the big problem you've got is that you don't have the tools to make good on your promise. For example, you just talked about the prosecutor general being a key player in this. You, I'm sure it's true to say, would like to fire the prosecutor general because he's a holdover from the true. previous Borisov regime. But you can't fire him. Indeed, he's fighting back and accusing you of waging an illegitimate war against his office. You have a profound problem here. 
It's true. If it was easy, it would have been done by now. So yes, we ha by constitution, we need two-thirds majority to change, let's say, the chief prosecutor's office and to change the constitution in a way that this would not be repeated again. But I'm truly a believer that if there is a will, there is a way. Uh, it may not happen as fast as every uh, voter would like, and uh, including myself and uh, our team. But taking these steps already. So uh, last week, we already have the ability for a first time in Bulgarian history for the judicial minister to actually put uh, accusations towards the chief prof prosecutor and the constitutional court voted for that. But there may be a lot of Bulgarians yeah. listening and watching to this interview. They want to know whether you're going to go after the oligarchs, the people who for years without any democratic accountability have actually been running your country. They also want to know if you're going to go after your predecessor, Mr. Borisov. There are some famous pictures that have been seen by all of your countrymen suggesting that in his bedroom he might have had gold and guns and all sorts of things. Now, he denies the veracity of those pictures. He denies all allegations of corruption. But are you going to investigate Borisov and these so-called oligarchs? So let me say it this way. Yesterday, I was at the chief prosecutor's office and I gave the data for 19 people, which there is already a lot of public information for what they have uh, done and how they're connected with corruption. So I went to the office and I gave all this information to the chief prosecutor and asked, asked the chief prosecutor, uh, unless you have noticed we have all this information, you better start working for it. And one of the people, uh, part of these 19 people, is Mr. Borisov himself. And let me tell you something, it's not the usual political talk opposition versus uh, the party in power. It's mm. about dividing the people that are have benefited from public funds and the people that haven't. And theft and corruption doesn't have a political party name. It has a full description of what they have done and it, it doesn't matter who it is. As I said, even if we find anybody from our coalition to do that, we'll have zero uh, tolerance See, and uh, we're going after it. I'm not afraid of any oligarchs. I, I made it clear on the national TV and I'm making it clear now. All these people that all these years have been mentioned as the, the very powerful and scary, we're here to make a change. And if the change happens by removing them, that's exactly what we're going to do. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Borisov, of course, denies uh, allegations of corruption that have been aired in your country. We need to make that clear. Let's move on. You have promised your people that uh, Bulgaria will be in a position to join the Schengen free movement area in the EU and, even more, you've promised that you're going to join the Eurozone by January 1st, 2024. Given the state of your economy, the state of organised crime and corruption and the lack of trust in Bulgaria in Brussels, how on earth are you going to deliver? The good thing is we're only six and a half million people. So in most places around the world, this is two neighborhoods of New York, two neighborhoods of Istanbul. It's, it's not, it looks like, a, like such a large problem, but when you think about six and a half million people, it's manageable. So first of all, the state of our economy is pretty good. Uh, I have to say this, at least this is the good part. Our revenue, tax revenue is in good shape. Our deficit is under control. Our debt to GDP yeah, is you, in yeah. very good shape. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the numbers aren't so terrible, I agree. But the bottom line is you're still the poorest nation in the European Union. That's reality. I really hope, and that's, of course, uh, how our economic policy is hoping to drive this. The moment we, we clean up the, uh, the place from the corruption uh, issue and the moment we have uh, government as we have right now that is very pro-business oriented, very transparent, I hope that the, the convergence that you're going to see from Bulgaria and catching up to EU standards would be uh, fully uh, integrated with this cleaning up of the corruption. Right. So I'm expecting high, high growth rates in the next few years. But you're right, the problems are there. And this is why we're here. Uh, if, if there was not these problems that you just described, I would have been doing my business and not been uh, at all related with the political life of Bulgaria. Right. The problems there's made a, us there's another, all, all rise to power. There's another issue uh, when it comes to your country's reputation in Brussels, and that is the issue of Macedonia, North Macedonia, and the stance you as a country have taken blocking 
all accession talks that North Macedonia believed it had been promised by the EU, but which Bulgaria now says cannot go ahead, based, it seems, on your claim that Macedonia is, in effect, really Bulgaria, and that the Macedonian language, for example, has no legitimacy because it's really Bulgarian, and you want all of that written, uh, for a start, it seems, into the Macedonian constitution. What on earth is going on here? To, to quote one uh, respected independent academic in Sofia, Ivalo Dicev, he says, there is no rational explanation for the Bulgarian veto on opening accession talks with North Macedonia. Are you going to change policy? Absolutely. There are few. Uh, so the very first day that my colleague Dimitar got into power uh, in North Macedonia, I went to visit him. Uh, and a week later, we made G2G where we signed three memorandums. Uh, a, a week later, uh, today, we have yet another meeting on transport and common infrastructure, and tomorrow is the first flight that's flying from Sofia to Skopje. So we've, we've changed the agenda to look at all the synergies we have versus all the problems. There are some problems. Uh, for example, one big issue for us uh, has been, uh, forget about all the historical uh, focus stuff that everybody is talking about. The, there are some other issues that are still we have to tackle with. For example, the Bulgarians in North Macedonia still don't have legal protection rights. Well, and that's well, with, about with all due respect, not, neither do, do, do ethnic Macedonians in Bulgaria. In fact, the European Court of Human Rights has heard more cases on that basis than any uh, experiences suffered by Bulgarians inside Macedonia. So you're on very shaky ground there. The bottom line is it comes down to your no, no, political so will because your, your president, your president says that you're reaching out to the Macedonian government is, quote unquote, a mistake. So you're going to have to take on a lot of powerful people in your own country if you want to normalize relations with Macedonia. But ju just to let me tell you, uh, the, good th the good news is when we're sitting with the prime minister of uh, of North Macedonia, we actually agreed fully on the fact that uh, the Bulgarians should have uh, the legal rights that all other Macedonians have and all other uh, Macedonians of other origins have, such as the Albanians. So we don't the good thing here, the good story is that we are all in understanding about this. The question is, how, what is the path to get there and what is the, the overall public opinion on both sides of the border right. that would allow just, us to yeah, get just, there faster. We're out of time almost. Just yes or no. Do you want North Macedonia to be in the EU? Absolutely. No doubt about that. All right. And a final question then, which is more personal. It's about you. Yours is a great story. You studied in the United States. You worked in a corporate uh, in America. Then you came back to Bulgaria because you wanted to make your life in your own country. Many, many smart young Bulgarians don't do what you did and return. They go and they stay away. You've got a massive demographic problem because there's a brain drain. How are you going to persuade smart young Bulgarians to stay in your country? Half of our political party is formed by smart young Bulgarians that have returned. And what we, the, all the potential of Bulgaria is absolutely incredible. I, I've studied economics at Harvard and all the economics models show we have to have a very strong growth. We have access to the biggest market in the world. We have good human capital. Our geography is placed well. So when you look at all these prerequisites, we should be a growing, fast-growing nation. We should be the eastern portal to the EU market. We have the lowest mm. taxation of, of all of uh, Europe. So just cleaning up the place, as I said, it's six and a half million people. I believe many Bulgarians would see the, the opportunity to be part of the change. And right. we already see this. I, we're returning people as we speak. Prime Minister Petkov, I thank you so much for joining me from Sofia. Thank you. Thank you so much as well.